It is wonderful, wonderful to be together this morning. Man, this weather cannot be beat. Um, we invite you to come on in, find that seat, and stand as we begin the service for this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Christ Community. Uh, if you are visiting with us, we're so glad that you're here with us. Uh, please uh, ask somebody around you if you have any questions. They are happy that you're here as well. Um, if you're here with us, uh, new or long time, uh, a reminder is, is one of the things that we want to be as a church is uh, we long to be a church that, that includes and is made up of people in process. Our, our assumption here is that none of us are finished products. Uh, our assumption is that the, the, our understanding of the gospel is that the gospel provides rest and renewal, that it is making us new. And so uh, part of renewal is being in process. And so uh, part of what we're doing here is coming together with other people who are in process. And as our prayer of invocation, we'll talk about we're waiting together. The, the nature of being in process is that you're waiting, you're, you're hoping, you're longing. The, the work is not done in you. It's not done in our world. And so we come and we hope and we wait and we sing together. And so our prayer of invocation is going to point us to that today. So join me. It comes out of Psalm 130. It says this. It says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. 
If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem his people from all their sins. Pray with me. Father, would you make us people who wait well as we look and hope for your, uh, for your return, for your salvation, for your goodness. Uh, let us also be people who celebrate, celebrate people, what you have done uh, in the past and what you're doing in the present. Uh, Father, would you help us to do that work of looking back and looking forwards, uh, even today, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's continue in worship.
Good morning, church. My name is Jason. Um, in my personal reading, I've been going through the book of Galatians, which if you're not familiar with it, it's Paul's ferocious defense for the gospel of grace. Uh, in particular, this church was being taught that they needed to do something on top of Jesus' grace for them. And Paul's like, no, you need to trust and you need the spirit of God to do the work through you. And so this confession, um, as Jasmine sent it to me earlier this week, um, I was already looking through the eyes of Galatians in that, and this confession talks about how we place our faith in our obedience. And so that just really hit home with me. But uh, confess with me. Heavenly Father, you are just and holy. There is no one like you. You are light, you are love, you are life. We confess the ways that we attempt to devalue you, deny your voice in our lives, and diminish our need of your grace. We have wrongly placed our faith in our obedience, our resolve, and our abilities. We are often blind to our own sins and rebellion, but we are quick to condemn others for their sins. We look down on those who fail to achieve our standards. We desire to justify ourselves by our own perceived goodness. We have turned to our own way, convincing ourselves that we can redefine light, love, and life in our own image. We are fools and need your forgiveness. O oh Lord, help our unbelief. Amen. Gracious God, remove our blindness in our self-justifying spirit. Help us to see your grace and your righteousness as our only hope for ourselves and this world. Replace our false forms of faith with trust and true believing. Take us out of ourselves and let us depend upon you alone. We are sinners who desperately need your salvation. We are broken and desire for your healing embrace. We have wandered and long to hear the sweet sound of your welcome again. We confess our sins and seek repentance, trusting in the one who is our great high priest, who knows our temptations and weakness, and who continues to love us and persevere with us, Jesus Christ, the friend of sinners. Amen. And now for the assurance of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, this is the assurance we have heard from God and now proclaim to one another. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Thanks be to God. Please stand. I'd just like to take a real quick minute to thank again the RUF team uh, last week for leading worship for us. That was a real gift to our team. Uh, to actually to take a break and to just participate in worship. And I know for Greg and I to sit with our girls um, within service was lovely. So I just want to say thank you again to the college ministry and for them getting to, uh, for doing that for us, because it was, it was pretty awesome. Um, we're going to lead on with We Are Not Overcome. Bones will break, 
Um, well, we are, uh, today is a, a sweet day for us as a church, uh, even if a little scary. Uh, we are sending uh, Andrew Brill, this is his final Sunday before a sabbatical. So not his final Sunday, but his final Sunday for about the next three months. So Andrew, would you come up here? Um, what's that? Everybody's excited you're leaving. Yeah. Um, one of, you know, as a church, we say uh, is our mission that we are joined together for the rest, renewal, uh, and restoration of all things. And uh, one of the things that means is that we think all of us need rest. Um, even the people who work in the church uh, don't work uh, endlessly. They don't work out of, a, of an ever-present source of endurance and energy, but they need time to step away uh, and to rest up and to be replenished and be with their families. And so um, it, is, uh, it is with joy that we acknowledge, Andrew, all of the incredible work uh, that you do at this church. 
Um, that's why it's a little scary that you're leaving. Um, but we promise, don't we, to not bother him at home, um, right? If you have questions uh, in the meantime while he's gone, just save them till mid-July and we'll get back to you. Um, no, if you have questions while Andrew's gone, if it's more, we have a great staff team. If you have questions more on the administrative and operational side, reach out to Jasmine. If you have questions on uh, the pastoral side, reach out to me. If you're not sure which they are, uh, send them to me and I'll send them uh, where they need to go. But um, we are all uh, excited to take on just a little bit more load so that Andrew can go and be with Ashley and his family. She's out of town this weekend. Uh, we we're hoping that, uh, to be able to thank her as well. Uh, Brill Kids, we are so excited uh, that you guys get three. I, I hope you're excited too, about three more months of more of your dad around. I'm going to miss his dad jokes in the office. I don't know if y'all are going to miss more of his dad jokes at home, um, but they're always great. So let me invite our elders to come up. We're just going to pray for, for Andrew uh, and for the Brills here for a little bit. Uh, okay. Yep. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll lead us in prayer. Uh, Lord Jesus, we are so incredibly grateful for the life of Andrew Brill. We're grateful for his many gifts. We're grateful for his heart. We're grateful um, for his hopefulness. We're grateful um, for how he has uh, served and led this church. Lord, I thank you um, for his friendship um, that I feel and that I know so many in this church feel. Lord, we pray for he and Ashley and the kids as they head into this three months of rest. Lord, we pray that you would give them rest, that you would give them the ability uh, to truly rest, to, to unplug and disconnect from what operate, from what takes up so much of his waking thoughts. Um, Lord, we pray that in this time you would knit them closer together as husband and wife, closer together as a family, that you would give them joy, that you would give them memories, uh, and that you would give them a sweet season of rest and uh, restoration uh, as they step away. Lord, we thank you uh, that you care more about um, being with us than in what we do for you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would be near to Andrew during this time of rest um, and that you would nurture him and that it would be a blessing to him, to Ashley, and to their whole family. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We have a gift. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, this is uh, a box of things um, that we pulled together. We, we, we didn't pull, it's way, it's it awesome. looks way better than it would if we had pulled it together. Ariel Farner took lead on this. You're going to need it's to awesome. hold this through the rest of the through, service. Through announcements. Yep. Um, awesome. But anyway, a uh, lot of uh, gratitude for y'all and hope you guys enjoy uh, some wonderful That's time cool. away. Thanks, Dave. I, I, I can't take I that. I am doing announcements, yeah. so I'm going to set this down. Okay? Um, we got a few months of announcements to get through, everybody, so buckle up. Um, no, it, it, it really is a gift to, to take a sabbatical. Our, our staff has a policy about uh, after five years, you, you take a sabbatical. And so uh, Christian and Anna will be up next. They'll be next year. Um, uh, you know, when, back when, one little illustration, then I'll be done. Um, uh, years ago, I couldn't do it now, but years ago uh, when I, I was training for a marathon, one of the pieces of advice is, uh, walk through the water stations uh, because a lot of times people just grab it and keep running because like, hey, I don't want to lose time. But the, the sense was, hey, if you walk through the water stations, you actually pick up pace as you go. Um, and so this is a little, that, that's what this is for a little bit. Um, I'm, not, I'm not fried. Uh, I, am, I am fatigued in some ways, tired in some ways. It's been a, it's been a full few years. Um, and so looking forward to a few months of, of walking through a water station and then uh, and then looking forward to being back. So love this place and you all. So thank you for making that possible. Um, thank you. Um, all right, announcements. Let's get to that. Uh, uh, we started our new adult seminar this morning that Chris Cahoon uh, and our creative team led. And so if you missed that, there's three more Sundays of it. And so we'd love for you to come to that. It's downstairs for the next three Sundays at 8.45, so we'd love for you to come to that. Uh, there is uh, child care, including a catechism class during that time, so uh, you can check that out. Uh, second, this coming weekend, so the, the 19th and 20th dates are up there, we have a Discover Seminar, so if you are new to Christ Community, if you've never been to one of these, uh, would love for you to come. This is really the 
hey, I've been here on Sunday mornings. What, what shapes this church? Uh, what, what makes it go? What's the mission and vision that, that directed? And so, uh, so we do that on Friday and Saturday night. Uh, it is part of the membership process. So if you are interested in becoming a member, you need to do that. If you're not sure if you want to be a member, that's fine. Lots of people who go through it aren't ready to become members, but it's just good information. It also helps you connect with some people. If you want to come to that Discover Seminar this weekend, we need you to register by the end of the day Tuesday uh, so that we can get all the information done and things ready. So do that. Uh, third, Creative Collective. So Chris Cahoon and Rachel Borntrager uh, led a story of grace last week about our creative team and what they do and uh, the event that's coming up, the Creative Collective, where we're inviting you all, artists and aspiring artists alike, to, uh, to produce something, to create something through the, or at the, the North Star of Belief. And so our sermon series is around uh, the book of John, that they may believe is the phrase there. And so would love for you to let, let your creative energy go using the word believe and create something produce something to share. And so that night, this will be really cool. Our church body uh, can come and view art on the 25th that our body has created. And so we'd love for you to do that. Uh, there's information on our website uh, about what that means. And you can reach out to, to Chris as well. And his his information is in the, the information on the website. Okay. And then finally, uh, City Group Night Out. So on April 27th, we do this periodically about once a year where we want to equip our city groups to just make it easy for you to hang out together. And so uh, so we will have child care at the building from 5.30 to 8.30 on Saturday the 27th. You can come uh, drop off your kids and do something as a city group. Uh, you can go play mini golf. You can go out to dinner. Uh, rumor has it Rachel Billingsley's band, not the worship team band, but her jazz band is playing at Jam and Java right down there. So how fun would that be? to drop kids here, and to go hang out as a city group. So we're just trying to make that easy on you all to, to connect in that way. So uh, those are announcements. There's others in your worship guide along with a connection card. If you're visiting with us, would love for you to fill that out. Uh, you can drop in the offering box in the back. Uh, with that, join me in the passing of the peace, which comes from Romans 14. It says this. It says, The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The peace of Christ be with you all. Therefore, let us welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Let us seek unity and pass the peace of Christ to each other. We do this by taking a couple minutes in the middle of our service, saying hey to somebody around you, and we'll be back in just a couple minutes.
Find that seat and stand as we continue the service for this morning. passage today is John 17, verse 1 through 26. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they received them. And have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. 
I do not ask that you would take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this section of your word. We thank you um, that you have uh, given this to us, this uh, model of the Son praying to the Father. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us. Lord, we, uh, we have so many voices in our lives, so many uh, things that clamor for our attention. Uh, Lord, we, right now, we seek to give our attention to your word. And as we do so, Lord, we do so in faith, trusting that you will speak, that these won't just be uh, the words on a page or the words in the mouth of a preacher, Lord, but that you would uh, speak to us what we need to hear. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So earlier this year, I started getting uh, disturbing mail uh, inviting me to my 25th high school reunion. And I thought, this, this must be meant for an older man, but no. Uh, 25 years. I don't know if we have any, anybody else in the class of 99? In the, okay. I mean, a lot of, there was a lot of prints in that year. There was a lot of that Party Like It's 1999 song. Um, but, uh, but yeah, 25 years. A lot has happened in the last 25 years uh, as I think back on life. Uh, it's been a long time, as they've reminded me, since 1999. I have uh, gone to college, gone to grad school, got married, have kids, moved a few times. A lot of life has happened in these last 25 years. Something else that has happened in the last 25 years is that in the last 25 years, since 1999, 40 million Americans have left the church. 40 million, that's about 12% of the American population, has disaffiliated from any organized religious practice. And it, uh, it's the single largest kind of socio-religious change in the history of American life, uh, to have that many people over the course of a relatively short period of time leave the church. Um, it has happened in big cities and in small towns. It's not necessarily a particularly kind of progressive urban phenomenon or a rural phenomenon. It's happened across uh, ethnic groups, that it has happened uh, widespread over uh, in American life. It, uh, it hasn't necessarily, if you survey Americans on what they actually believe, uh, it shows that a lot of Americans, about as many as have in the past, still believe in God, but are finding it harder and harder to believe in the church, uh, finding it harder and harder to believe and to invest, in their, invest their lives in a concrete local expression of, uh, of the church. And I say believe in the church because the church is an article of Christian faith. If you were here on Easter Sunday when we read the Apostles' Creed out loud together, a creed that unites churches around the world, one of the things that we confessed after confessing our belief in the Father and the Son is we believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Right? To believe in the church obviously is more than just to believe that it exists. Everybody knows that 
you know, to believe in the church, it's obviously there is a church, but to believe in the church is to believe that it actually exists as God's intention, right? That it exists as the presence and extension of God's presence in the world, uh, and that it matters to Him, and that He's promised to work through it for the good of the world. And it's, got, it's getting harder and harder to believe that for many, many Americans. Um, there's a number of, of reasons for that. Uh, you know, I think in some ways the internet has made it easier than ever for us to understand and to know, you know, a story of abuse or kind of tox- toxicity in the life of the church or hypocrisy in the life of the church that's always existed. Now, you don't just know about it when it happens in your church, you're aware of when it happens kind of anywhere. And, uh, you know, the forces of kind of individualism in American life mean that we in- increasingly say, well, no, my, my spirituality, my faith is mostly about me finding an authentic expression of, of me, of what I believe, of what I want, about my desires, versus joining up uh, with what seems like an institution uh, that can seem far removed from our own experience. But as an article of faith, to believe that the church is God's very presence on earth is one that Christians uh, do hold to. That this uh, ordinary, sinful, sometimes corrupt, sometimes a little bit cringeworthy group of people uh, matters to God and is God's intention for our life in Him. To believe in the church for many of us today is actually harder. It's easier sometimes to believe in the virgin birth or the resurrection of the dead than to believe that the church, as it actually exists, is God's plan for the redemption of of the world. And yet Jesus' prayer today, the the passage that we read today, is Jesus speaking to the Father and showing us that the belief in the church, the belief in the importance of the church, isn't just kind of an optional add-on to an otherwise personal commitment, but that it is grounded in the very nature of God that the church uh, is grounded in the eternal love of the Trinity, Father for the Son, Son for the Father, Father, Son for the Spirit, that uh, even God Himself, even God the Father, is not self-sufficient or alone, but from eternity has been in community, that from eternity God the Father, if you notice that language, He's been giving glory and love to God the Son, and God the Son is now giving glory and love to God the Father, and they're going to send the Spirit into the church right, that even God uh, doesn't exist in isolation, but exists in community. And that the church, in fact, all things, C.S. Lewis called the Trinity the fountainhead of all creation. Everything that God creates, everything that God makes comes out of the overflow of the love that the Trinity has for one another. And so let's look at uh, at this John 17. There's a passage that can help us to ground the importance of community life in a story that is much bigger and older uh, than we might think, a story rooted back before creation itself, grounding the church in something eternal and unchanging. You know, I love this. Jesus, remember, we're in the midst of this upper room discourse. So Jesus has been talking to his disciples. He's washed their feet. They've celebrated uh, Passover together. They're preparing uh, for his arrest. And he's been talking to them over the last several chapters about discipleship, about their mission, about all these things. And now he steps aside to pray. And I think it, might, it hit me this time uh, reading this passage. I think I'd always imagined when Jesus, when it shifts to John 17, that Jesus goes off by himself somewhere to pray, right? And the Gospels do have stories like that where Jesus goes alone to pray. He goes up on the mountain to be with God the Father. But that's not what's happening here. He goes from talking to his disciples, and then it just says he lifts his eyes up and starts talking to the Father. So he's now, he goes from talking to the disciples to still in front of and with the disciples, but now talking to God the Father. He's inviting them uh, in to listen in to this conversation that he's having with the Father, to listen in uh, to this moment of prayer. And you might look at this and go, why is Jesus praying at all? Right? I mean, the, Jesus has told us, he tells us in this passage, he's told us before that he and the Father are one, uh, that he knows the Father's will and he does the Father's will, that he's in the Father and the Father's in him. And you go, well, then why do you have to pray? Right? If, you're, if you're one, why do you need to pray? And part of it is, I think, that he's, in, he's doing this as a model for his disciples. Uh, the Gospel of John doesn't record the Lord's Prayer 
uh, that the synoptic gospels do when the disciples say, Lord, teach us to pray, and he does. So I think in some ways, this is John's version of that, where he's teaching the disciples to pray by modeling prayer for them. In fact, uh, you know, at the healing of Lazarus, he prays and he says, you know, Father, thanks for hearing me. I know that you always hear me, but I say this on their behalf, right? He's wanting them to hear what's going on between him and the Father. But I think in light of what Jesus says, it's more than that. It's more than just modeling prayer for his disciples. He's inviting them into a relationship with him and with his Father, that, that they are going from being uh, kind of on the outside of that relationship, listening to Jesus talk about the Father, to now Jesus inviting them into this relationship that he has with the Father that has existed before creation. This language that he uses about, I am in them, and you are in me, and they're in me, and I am in you, right? It's, it's like in this moment, the Trinity is, is kind of opening up to invite normal, ordinary people into participating in their love for one another that has always existed, always existed in this exchange of love and glory. One of the words that the early church used to describe this uh, nature of the, Christ, of, the, of the Trinity, where they're making room for one another, giving glory to one another, showing love for one another, uh, the Greek word that they would use for this uh, was perichoresis, which just means to dance around, right? Cho uh, it's where we get choreography, right? The idea of a dance that the Father, Son, and Spirit from eternity past have been stepping in and out and around from each other, glorifying one another, loving one another, in this expression of their love. And now out of that love, they're inviting the church into it, you and me into it. Jesus' prayer here models that the inner union and life of the Trinity is the source of the church's message, mission, and unity. That the, that life of the Trinity is the source of our message, our mission, in our unity. First, the message of the church. Look at what he says. We'll look at the last verse first. Jesus says, I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you love, have loved me may be in them and I in them. Right? Look, he said, I, I shared this message with you, this message that the love that you have for me as the eternal Son, the only begotten Son of God, the love that you have for me might be in them, and they might know that you love them in the same way that you love me. That through my grace, through my, my coming down and entering into their life and dwelling with them, that as they believe in me, as they, as they uh, trust in me, they will become adopted sons and daughters of God the Father, and that you, God, will look, God the Father will look on them with the exact same love that he looks on Jesus Christ with. Think about uh, this perfect love that the Father has for the Son. Remember at the, in the baptism story when heaven opens up and God the Father speaks over the Son, this is my only Son, with Him I am well pleased. That, that same love and delight and pleasure the Father looks on His only Son with, He now, through faith, looks at us with that same love and He feels about us in that same way. That's what's uh, being offered to us in the gospel. John uh, earlier says uh, that all who believed in his name, Jesus gave the right to be called children of God. He gave access to that perfect loving relationship with the Father. If I'm honest, uh, I and I think a lot of us often live with this kind of unease and wonder about what God thinks and feels about us, right? As God... Um, what does God really feel uh, towards me? Does He love me? Does He even like me? When I go to Him, does He want to spend time with me? Is He too busy? Does He have other stuff going on? I think it's really hard for most of us to believe about the eternal God, that He looks at us with all of the love. If you could, if you could remove sin from the equation uh, from which human parents look at their children, that God the Father looks at us with that, that kind of love. If you've been uh, in the church for any length of time, or even it's probably sufficient just to have grown up in the South, you've probably had someone ask you at some point, if you were to die tonight, right, it's always at night, bad things happen at night, if you were to die tonight and were to appear before God the Father, why would He let you into heaven? If you were to die tonight, why would God let you know? I was talking with a friend of mine who grew up in the Southern Baptist Church, and he said, there, in, in his church only, the, the version of this he got was, if you got hit tomorrow by a beer truck, 
And, uh, and he said they were convinced that whether it was in the truck or out of the truck, it was beer that was going to get us, right? Um, but he, uh, anyway, the, so the question, right, if you were to die tonight what, and God were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? And it's a, it's a story that's meant to be a diagnosis, right? Do, do you say, well, because I've been good enough, because I've done enough, because I'm righteous enough? Or do you say something more along the lines of, well, only because of the grace of Jesus, right? Only because of the cross of Christ am I allowed, am I, am I, should I be welcomed into heaven? And at least as long as I've been a Christian, I have, I've been able to answer that question, and I'm, and I'm really grateful for that, that idea that, that the only reason we can stand before God eternally is through the love and grace and forgiveness of Jesus through his sacrifice on the cross. But what has been a harder question for me to answer uh, through all of my Christian life isn't if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven? It's how does God feel about you right now and why? Right? So, in the off event that you don't die tonight, but wake up tomorrow morning, when you wake up, what kind of God do you wake up to? Right? How does that God feel about you in the moment? And the gospel is that that answer is grounded in the same reality that the if you were to die tonight question is grounded in, right? Because of Jesus, right? Because of faith in Christ, because of my union with Jesus, God right now feels about me the same love and affection and joy that he feels in his son. That that's what adoption into the family of God means. Not just that we get to go to heaven when we die, but that in this life we can experience the perfect love of a perfect father. That he loves us like that. The, the evangelist Tony Campolo used to say, do you believe that God loves you so much that he has your picture in his wallet? That was dated, right? That he has your picture in his smartphone, if God has a smartphone. Right, that God uh, puts your shoddy artwork on his refrigerator, that he uh, gets excited when you come by to spend time with him, right? that God delights in us above and beyond the way any, child, any earthly parent delights in their children. So the Christian message of God's grace and love is rooted in the love of the Father for the Son in the life of the Trinity. Secondly, the church's mission is rooted in the life of the Trinity. Look at uh, verses 14 through 19. Uh, he says this, Jesus says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into, their wor into the world. Right? He, Jesus here is praying about a tension that, that the church has lived in for 2,000 years. Right? That he's saying, I'm, I'm praying for their protection. I'm praying for their, this word he uses, sanctify them, make them holy, make them yours. Grow them up more and more uh, in my image. But I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. Right? In fact, I'm sending them into the world, into every nation, every culture, every city, every place that they might be in the world, yet different than the world, right? That they would, they would live in some ways very much like their neighbors, that they would uh, go about their work, that they would live their lives, they would raise their children, they would seek their good. So they would be, they would be in the world everywhere that you send them, but at the same time that you would protect them from the corrosive influences of the world, right? That you would, that you would protect them and keep them, keep them holy. And so this, this tension that, that Jesus is praying for the church in is that they would be uh, in the world, but not of the world, that they would be sent into every corner of the world, but sent as a unique and different outpost of a different kind of world in the midst of this world. I'm going to use my once monthly Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, quote today. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, was a German theologian and pastor in the early 20th century, and I'm doing a doctorate on his work right now, so that's why I get to use, I limit my, my uses. Um, in 1935, he found himself in an interesting position. So he had been uh, a representative and a pastor within what was called the Confessing Church. Uh, as Hitler rose to power in Germany, one of the steps that he took was to consolidate power over the Christian church. So uh, increasingly, uh, if you walked into a Christian church, a Protestant church, or a Catholic church, anywhere in Germany, you would see not only crosses, but swastikas, 
right, you would hear not only was Jesus head of the church, but in Germany, Hitler was also head of the church. And so he had early Nazism, there was kind of this battle for the soul of the church. And like most areas, Hitler, Hitler won in that way. And so uh, Bonhoeffer, this was, he was a young man. Uh, and in 1935, he left Germany. He, was in, he took a pastorate of a German-speaking church in London. And then in 1935, he decides that he has to go back to Germany. Uh, even though he knows that he's, you know, the confessing church is lost, they're now underground, uh, they're now, participation in this church is now punishable by death. Um, so he went back into Germany knowing that it was likely going back towards his own death. And he writes a letter to his brother, Carl, in 1935, talking about his decision to come back. And he says uh, in that, that the only hope of the, of the German people during this time, the only hope for, in, that, in some ways, the peace of the world, is for the German church to recover what he called a new kind of monasticism. So just like monks and nuns used to kind of cordon themselves off from the world to seek holiness, to seek the presence of God, he said, we need to do something like that. Because German culture and, and Nazi ideology has crept so far into the church that we need to adopt kind of a counterculture within the church that's for the good of the world. He, in fact, started uh, a seminary community training pastors in a kind of a monastery that he then sent out, most of them to their death eventually, uh, to pastor and serve as missionaries in Nazi Germany. Even in the midst of this, uh, even in the midst of, as he did this, as he talked about this kind of new kind of monasticism, even still, he never was comfortable entirely with saying, we're going to wall ourselves off from the world. We're going to wall ourselves off from our neighbors and the people around us. Because he knew this. This is what he, this is what he wrote. Vocation is responsibility. So vocation, the call of God, is responsibility, our response to the call of Jesus. Vocation is responsibility. And responsibility is the whole response of the whole person to reality as a whole. That, that our response to Jesus' call on our lives means a responsibility to God and a responsibility to our neighbors. That he felt a sense that, that his call to follow Jesus, his call to be a pastor, couldn't be divorced from his call to love his Jewish neighbors living in Germany and facing that threat. And so he and, and, and others like him, he wasn't the only one, uh, took a posture of going back into Germany to be a church that was, as Jesus prays here, in Germany but not of Germany, right? Within the culture but not, not captive to Nazi ideology in order to be a prophetic and life-giving witness in the place where God had sent them. And this is the exact posture that, that God calls the church in every corner of the world into, to be in the place where he sends us, but not of it, to be a community that's in America, that says a, a resounding yes to some things in our world, a yes to the beauty of creation, a yes to the good of our neighbors, a, a yes to the beauty of what's good in our culture, and a no at the same time to what's corrosive and sinful and dehumanizing and corrupting in the world. And to live at, with both of those things for the sake of our neighbors. And Jesus is now praying for his disciples to do that. And then finally, the church's unity is bound up in the life of the Trinity. Uh, look at verses 20 through 23. I do not ask for these only, so not just for these 12 disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their words. So now that's all of us, that's us. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given to me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Right? What Jesus is saying is that the, the church's oneness should be built on and modeled out of the oneness of the Trinity. Right, just as the Trinity is eternal unity and diversity, right? Eternally, the Trinity, the Son is not the Father, the Father and the Son are not the Spirit, they're unique beings, and yet they live in perfect unity. That the church is meant to be not kind of melded into codependent, you know, we're all kind of uh, finding our identity purely in our identification with a, a group, but each individuals, each not losing ourselves, but each in a unity that's bigger than ourselves, a unity that dies to self to seek the good of another, a, a, a unity that makes way for per, out of personal preference for the preferences of another, uh, a unity that's built out of the love that the Father, Son, and Spirit 
have for one another. I think unity and witness are perhaps more tied together than they've ever been in our culture, that in a world that is, more, that is so deeply fragmented, right, where we look at one another with suspicion and hatred and prejudice and where we're divided on so many cultural and political and ethnic lines. To be a church that says, no, no, actually here uh, we're coming together in Jesus, even if we differ in some of these other areas that, that tend to drive humanity apart from one another. Our unity can be a witness to the beauty and reconciling power of God, unity in the midst of diversity. Uh, this is one of the ways that we talk about uh, our vision as a church, our mission as a church, is that we seek to embody kingdom community, that every tribe, tongue, and nation unity that is the reality of the church in heaven, that that would be expressed and limit, you know, the best we can in this life, where we'd be bond together in this church uh, across the lines of ethnicity and gender and ability and politics and all of those things, that we would live and express unity as a kingdom community. And that would be a, a witness to the world. A little while ago, I heard the story of a man named Lowell Ivey. Uh, Lowell uh, lived a troubled childhood and for a stretch of his early life was not somebody you would have wanted to run into. Um, and then in his uh, late teens, early 20s, uh, through gang involvement, had gotten involved in a life of crime and then was arrested um, for armed robbery. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison and, uh, in Texas, and then when he went uh, into prison, he came to realize pretty quickly that if he was going to survive in prison, he had to affiliate with a gang, uh, with a group in order to find protection, and he affiliated with a white supremacist uh, gang in prison. And over the course of those years, became more and more hardened in those views, right? What started as a way to survive became this kind of deep ideology that held a sway over him. Then in, uh, at one point during his prison term, he was in a fight in prison and assaulted a man and was committed to 10 years in solitary confinement. So he had 15 years in prison, 10 years of which were now in solitary confinement where he couldn't speak to anyone, uh, but he did have uh, access to a radio and he started to get uh, radio sermons through a, a preaching ministry. And over time of listening to those sermons over the course of 10 years, um, he came to be convicted of the idea that his racist views were sin, right? He, had, he hadn't been able to put it all together yet, but he'd come, he at least knew, if he hadn't come to real faith, he knew that that kind of hatred had taken a, you know, had become ugly in his heart and it had really, really corrupted his life. And so when he finally was released from solitary prison, uh, solitary confinement, he said he went to the one place in the prison where I knew that black, white, and Latino inmates gathered together and weren't divided by race, he went to the chapel services. So he started to get involved in the church services. Um, and as he went, he got involved in Bible studies. And then over time, God used that to convert him uh, to where he actually, Lowell now is the head of uh, the denomination, the PCA, our denomination, uh, our prison ministry. He's an ordained minister. But what, what wooed him towards the Christian faith wasn't necessarily at first just the truth of it that he came to later understand. But it was this community, this ability to look and say, well, the only place in this prison where people try to care about one another beyond the lines of race and gang affiliation is in the church. And I want to go, I want to be a part of that, I want to find my way into that because I know that I need it. You know, if you were in any of the cities in the first century Mediterranean world where the gospel spread after the resurrection, it is likely that you could say to yourself, you know what, the only place in Ephesus or Corinth or Rome where Jews and Gentiles live together, are in these strange little new churches, right? It's the only place where people are trying to live together across the lines of slave and free, pagan and Jew, male and female, that, that unlike anywhere else in those early communities, those cities, the church stood out as a place of kingdom community, of reconciled unity and diversity. And that's what Jesus is praying for, for the church then and for the church now, that because we are united in Christ, we can be different in much else, much of the other things that divide us from one another. And so Jesus prays for church unity, uh, both inside, the, I mean, I think the, the applications of this are both for us inside the local church, that we would commit to working across difference, we would commit to working towards understanding one another, that we would commit to embodying that kind of kingdom community, and I think in the way we relate to the church outside of the, the one local Christ community church. 
right? Jesus, I think it's incredibly uh, insightful that the last thing Jesus prays for is that his people would be one. And we've spent more or less the last 2,000 years uh, trying to work against that, right? That, that every, every chapter of church history tends to be marked by division, tends to be marked by whether it's through theological dispute or ethical dispute or all of that, that we've just continued to fragment. And if, if Jesus cared enough about it to pray for it as his last words as he prepared to head towards the cross, we ought to lean into and lean towards unity with our brothers and sisters in different church traditions, in different church bodies. Right? I had a counseling professor tell me once that the reason that the Bible says God hates divorce, which it does say, is because divorce tells a lie about the nature of God. Right? If, if, the na- if marriage is meant to show that, that love, covenanted love, is reliable and solid and unconditional, divorce tells a lie about that. It says, well, not always. Right? In, in, in a sinful world, it's not always. And I think you could say the same for divorce within the church, when churches divorce from one another, that God hates it because it tells a lie about who he is, because Jesus says they may be one as we are one, as the Father is in the Son is in the Spirit, that we should seek to lock arms with our brothers and sisters in different church communities to demonstrate the unity uh, that we share. It's one of the reasons that if you were able to join us uh, for our Good Friday service uh, with our brothers and sisters at St. James Baptist, Right? That's one of the reasons that's such a sweet and powerful experience, right? Is because it's a moment of leaning into what should be, right? Churches cooperating, worshiping together across denominational, ethnic, all sorts of lines, cultural, traditional lines, to be one is Jesus prayed that we would be one. And so, in a world where it is incredibly hard and increasingly hard to believe that the church matters, to believe that the church is good, to believe that the church is an expression of of God's grace in a broken world. Jesus says, no, no, no. It's as core to the existence of of all things as the Trinity itself, that God calls us and sends us to be on his mission with his message in the unity of love. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do pray that you would help us to embody uh, the unity that you call us to, that you would help us to, to embody the mission that flows out of Uh, your very sending of your son for us, and that you would help us to embrace and rejoice in the message that we are loved uh, in Christ as fully and as deeply as the Father loves the Son. Lord, I know for for all of us, and and maybe some in this room feel it acutely right now, it can be hard to believe sometimes that church is worth it with all the pain that can be involved, with the sin, the hypocrisy, all that can be involved in staying. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us grace, uh, that you would give us hope, and you would give us love, that you would help us uh, to ground ourselves in you and to stay in uh, the journey of faith with our brothers and sisters, because we can't do it alone. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to continue worshiping God now through giving our offerings. If uh, If you'd like to give, you can do so either through following the instructions on the screen or there's a box uh, back in the lobby and you can give that way. One of the places uh, where we most clearly see our unity in Christ together is around this table. Uh, The communion meal that we are about to to come and take is a family meal. It's something that we do together. There is, of course, a a kind of vertical component to communion. We take a moment and and pause and confess our sin and are welcomed by Jesus as individuals into his presence. 
But there's something about this that is a communal practice, right? You're not just doing this alone in your home. You're doing this with one another around a table. Tables uh, in the ancient world and in this world are a place where people come together to enjoy all that this life holds. And so as we come to this table, as we are welcomed to the table that Jesus uh, welcomed his disciples to, be aware of those around you. Be aware of those down your road. That, right, this is not something that's just between you and Jesus. This is something that's between you and Jesus and all of your brothers and sisters uh, that we are called together into this life with. This table, as we come, is, uh, is a, um, an article of faith. It's something that we come to saying we believe ourselves to be sinners in need of salvation, and we recognize in Jesus uh, the source of grace and mercy that we need. We recognize that, that every week there's folks with us who are not yet at a place where they're ready to, to make that act of faith, right? You're not yet at a place where you are uh, certain about the claims of Jesus, and the scriptures tell us uh, that you should wait to come to this table until you can do so in the faith that unites us around this table. Uh, we're so glad that you're here. We hope that you'll keep coming, keep bringing your questions, and join us at the table very, very soon. The scriptures tell us that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat, all of you. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we need you. We need uh, the life that you offer. Lord, we confess that uh, day in, day out, there's so many things that this world holds out uh, that tells us that we will find life in those places. And yet, Lord, you have shown us that you alone are the fountain of true and everlasting life. You alone offer living water, bread from heaven. And so, Lord, as we come to this table, we pray that you would meet us here and that you would feed us by your grace. Lord, give us faith uh, as we come to receive you and the bread and the wine, uh, not merely as an, as an ordinary bread and wine, but to receive you as, as you are, uh, present with us by your Spirit. And so, Lord, we pray as we come to you that you would meet with us, feed us, and nurture us in the faith. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come forward as you're ready. We have gluten-free bread available to my left, and when you come to the trays, the, uh, the red cups are wine, the clear are grape juice.
Stand for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son.
wonderful uh, worshiping with you all today. Uh, if you're new with us, we would love uh, for a chance to get to know you, tell you a little bit about our church. We have a welcome table out back and a free gift for you, uh, so please do stop by there. But we end, as we do each week, with a benediction. That's a reminder that God's presence and His grace and His promise aren't uh, constrained to the four walls of the church or this time that we spend on Sunday morning, but that He goes with us every single place that He sends us. And so receive this benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.